Welcome to the Bitcoin Source Podcast, the ultimate destination for all things Bitcoin. Today, we have an expert guest with us, Tony Yazbek, the head of cybersecurity at the Bitcoin Way, leading provider of innovative and comprehensive Bitcoin services. Tony's insight in the world of Bitcoin and cybersecurity is something that we promise to provide some insightful value with. So once again, welcome, Tony. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. Most definitely. So Tony, of course, um, I know that you're a head of cybersecurity and you're really uh, laser focused on making sure that the Bitcoin way has a way to protect its customers. So as the head of cybersecurity at the Bitcoin way, you play a crucial role in ensuring the security of those Bitcoin related services. Could you share your perspective on the evolving landscape in the realm of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and what measures individuals and businesses should uh, they prioritize to safeguard their assets? Absolutely, man. I mean, uh, as you know, cryptocurrency is, is evolving at a very fast, fast pace. A lot more interest is being generated in, in, in the space on a daily basis. And uh, we have to be, you know, very cautious going in because we can get into trouble really fast at the same way you know if we're not if we're not taking you know the necessary measures we're dealing with money in cryptocurrency i mean we're, we're specifically targeting bitcoin in the service that we offer we don't touch any other cryptocurrency um, but bitcoin fundamentally is money and so when we're dealing with this you know there's a lot of elements that need to be accounted for to ensure that you don't inadvertently lose that money whether it's uh, from lack of knowledge, whether it's an accident, an, an accident, whether it was an attack, what have you, um, we emphasize very good security practices for everyone. And going into the space, because it's a it's a new it's a new industry. I mean, Bitcoin, we've never had anything like it in the history of humanity. So there's a lot of education around the space that still needs to be put out. A lot of people still need to understand it properly and understand why the necessary steps that we take are required. Um, we can't mess around with this. I mean, you can't take shortcuts if you're going to adopt the, uh, the approach of becoming you know, your own bank, the, the whole self-custody. There are rules and disciplined guidelines that you absolutely have to follow in order to minimize um, risk of loss. And all of these, all of this information is, you know, what we put out. We we sort of break it down into bit-sized pieces for Mr. and Mrs. Everybody to understand. So this is primarily what we're about. So like a bit of a, a security IT team in the Bitcoin space. Uh, my background is kind of unique and diverse where, um, of course, I, I'm, I'm the founder of this podcast. I've done a lot of Bitcoin writing, but I also have an IT background, cyber uh, software engineer background. And I always think about just, of course, Bitcoin has its own in-house security protocol as far as making sure that your private keys are held securely. You don't tell people how much Bitcoin you actually hold, all the stuff that Bitcoiners know about. But what I find interesting about your role, Tony, is that on the cybersecurity side, you're dealing with obviously clients that have usernames, passwords, um, you know, important data that they might not want the world to have access to. And I'm always curious to know, like educating individuals on the importance of maintaining control over their private keys and the best practices for securely managing those Bitcoin holdings. Is that something that the Bitcoin way really instills or is that something that you kind of work on and tinker on in the background without people really knowing about it? No, we absolutely instill this. I mean, education is a very big part of the services that we offer. Um, we approach every individual with a lot of patience. Most people that come to us are not technical by any stretch. And uh, I've been dealing with that type of environment for about 25 years. So sitting down with individuals and breaking down the com some complex, um, uh, complex technologies and security measures is something that I'm you know, very comfortable doing. Um, there's a lot of education involved, uh, beginning with why it's important to learn these things, especially when it comes to Bitcoin, uh, making people aware, you know, of uh, phishing, phishing scams and all sorts of, you know, crazy things that are online. The more and more Bitcoin becomes, you know, uh, popular, the more people are aware of it, you can anticipate an increase in all sorts of phishing attacks, trying to scam people out of their money. So it's important that they're aware, you know, of the best practices, whether it's uh, 
which hardware to use, whether which software to use, how to set it up, how to configure it, how to protect their passwords, how to pick their passwords, um, to be aware of social engineering attacks, you know, making sure software updates are, uh, are done diligently. Um, all of these things are very, like, they're very crucial and they, they, they are, they form the basis of a lot of the education that we put out. So uh, we sit down with individuals and, you know, we, we take it one step at a time until it absolutely makes sense. Now, all our, all our interactions with people are done on a one-to-one -one basis, whether in person, if, you know, they're geographically in the same location or via over video. So video, when it comes to video, we do a lot of screen sharing. Um, one thing to note is that all our screen sharing uh, sessions are read only. There is absolutely no remote control of anyone's machines. So when it comes to um, the display of sensitive information, whether it's passwords, private keys, and what have you, um, we instruct the user to turn off the screen sharing or we do it for them. And the ability to turn it back on is in the user's hands. So there's zero risk that there's any you know, potential remote control of anyone's machine um, from our end. And that's done purposefully to ensure that you know, individuals are comfortable knowing that their information is safe at all times um, throughout the entire, throughout the entire process. <clears throat> so, yeah, so this is, you know, we, we, we put a lot of emphasis on this because, you know, you don't want people to feel uncomfortable or to feel that potentially someone on the outside has access to anything that could put their funds at risk. Most definitely. And, uh, you know, Tony, like, how do you feel about biometrics? Do you guys add any of that into your entry process for clients or is it just solely based on username, password? Um, uh, a forward pin or something like that. Like, how's that process work? Both. I mean, we we like to. We, first of all, we like to set up like a proper digital management infrastructure with people. I mean, f there's so much information that needs to be safeguarded. Um, with regards to Bitcoin, you know, a lot of people put emphasis on the seed phrase, which of course is you know the most important thing. But aside from seed phrases, there's a lot other pieces of information that also needs to be saved. So where do you save these things, right? So we sit down with individuals and we like we we <clears throat> we lay out different options to see you know what what each person is comfortable with. Um, I don't put uh, I don't uh, like uh, brush off the use of encrypted password managers. Some people are allergic to this. I don't I don't think they're a big uh, risk factor when configured and set up properly. Especially if you if you handpick specific ones that are open source that have you know regular audits you know performed on them so that the the risk of any breach or data leak is you know pretty close to zero they're very useful um, we use them to generate um, very comp complex passwords because it's not going to be the individual that's going to be memorizing these passwords but they're they're designed more to protect against cybersecurity attacks like for example i like to use passwords at minimum 50 character alphanumeric or more why so much one, because I don't have to remember it, the system will do it for me. But two, is because when, put a, when tested against AI supercomputer attacks, it would take about seven quadrillion years as of this conversation for such a, such a, such a computer to break a password of that length. So we take that you know, very seriously. We show people how to generate them, where to save them, how to use them to get used to that mindset. Most people, are not even close to using, you know, that type of disciplined approach when it comes to passwords. And this is where a lot of them get into trouble, unfortunately. So <clears throat> we break that cycle by re-educating and pointing out the emphasis that passwords are important, two-factor authentication is important. Um, we can use biometrics, you know, but that would be like sort of like an extra on top of the foundations that we like to set beforehand. And um, yeah, I mean, Really, it comes down to getting the individual used to this new world now, you know, like when it comes to these things, as most of them are not. And this is one of our biggest challenges that, you know, we, uh, we seek to overcome to make this, you know, a lot more digestible for, you know, everyday people that are not used to working in this space. Hey there, fellow Bitcoin enthusiasts. We just wanted to take a moment to appreciate you for tuning in to the Bitcoin Source, a Bitcoin conversation. Your support means the world to us as we dive into the exciting world of Bitcoin, blockchain, and all things cryptocurrency. If you've been enjoying our content, don't forget to hit that like button. It's like a virtual high five that keeps us motivated. And hey, sharing is caring. If you know someone who'd geek out over Bitcoin as much as we do, 
hit that share button. Finally, if you want to stay up to date with all our latest episodes and insights, make sure to hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell. You won't want to miss a single update. Thanks for being a part of our community. Keep exploring and remember, the future is decentralized. Now back to the episode. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that, that insight, Tony. I think that that's going to be super helpful for people that are not only looking into Bitcoin, but they might be interested in the Bitcoin way because there's been so many breaches. There's been so many hacks with a lot of companies. And that's why I kind of elaborated on the biometrics and asking some of the questions that I think a lot of Bitcoiners might be curious about. The integration of Bitcoin into businesses raises this unique security considerations, of course, like we just talked about. You know, how do you guide these businesses in implementing those secure practices when accepting Bitcoin payments or integrating Bitcoin related technologies into their own operations? Yeah, see, biz businesses are not that much different from individuals, ex for the exception that there, there's more people involved. Right. And there's like more um, potential trust vectors in an organization compared to to an individual. We spend a lot of time educating these um, these businesses as to what what the benefits of Bitcoin are, what the security practices are. Same thing, using complicated uh, um, complicated passwords, two FA, uh, two FA authentication, biometrics when needed, setting up proper cold wallets, picking up the setting up the right hardware, uh, you know, using the right software. Um, we actually go as far as um, double checking the network depending on the size of the business and the risk factor of certain companies we can perform simulated intrusion tests to see okay is your network secure is it hackable we actually go in and try to hack it and if we're successful generate a report you know listing all the weak points of that network and how to address them um, so we cover a lot of these elements before even you know focusing on the bitcoin itself because like these are all details that many people may not necessarily think of but when you work in this space it's almost like an instinctive thought process you know like i mean you're building your own bank whether it's for yourself or for your business but you're interacting with many other elements around the bitcoin itself and all of these are equally important so we like to make sure that all of these potential attack vectors are looked at accounted for are as secure as possible that people understand you know what they are where they are, how to access them, and what have you. So uh, we, we, you know, we, we put out a lot of education on that front. Big businesses, you know, when, when we're setting up cold storage, you know, we engage in multi-sig, in some cases collaborative multi-sig for businesses that require it. I'm not personally a fan <coughs> of multi-sig or collaborative um, sig for individual users because I feel it adds an unnecessary level of uh, complexity for most people that's unnecessary. I mean, unless the, the risk, you know, the risk factor of a specific individual really dictates it, there's many ways to remain ultra secure without having to deploy, you know, that extra level of complexity normally associated with multi-sig setups. Yeah, I kind of wanted you to expound on that a little bit more. So, like, I know you mentioned that you're not a fan of collaboration, but I think, and I could be wrong, you're more of an expert on this than me. But, you know, collaboration amongst cybersecurity professionals sometimes can be crucial for staying ahead of some of these threats. Like you have, you know, you know, forums and stuff that cybersecurity, you know, analysts and stuff kind of look around to see what new thing is kind of coming into the industry. So why don't you feel like, you know, collaboration is that important? Because you have like companies like Casa, um, you know, some of these other companies that use multi-sig two-factor authentication. And if, you know, God forbid something happens to you and no one knows your private keys, it can be kind of time released out to people through an estate or through a trust. So, like, why? I'm, I'm just curious to pick your brain on, like, why are you kind of against the collaborative model? And, you know, the complexity sometimes may be good because if it's complex, it's harder to crack. Well, <clears throat> in terms of the collaboration, I wasn't referring specifically to the cybersecurity aspect of things. Like when you met, when you when you mentioned cybersecurity, we do collaborate with other experts. But on the cybersecurity side of things, is uh, the collaboration is more, for example, if I want to audit a network to make sure that it's secure, my team will go in and hack it, put out a report, you know, listing out all the weak spots. We may collaborate on an outside team just to get a fresh pair of eyes to make sure that maybe were we thorough enough? Did we miss something? Um, you know, could we have done something better? So we sort of get like that second opinion validation for the cybersecurity side of things. 
the part that I was referring to where I'm not too comfortable, too comfortable with on an individual basis is more on a self-custody, like the multi-sig self-custody. And why I say this, it's not because it's not secure. Multi-sig is absolutely more secure than single-sig. That's, that's a fact. But in my experience, the issue when you start, it's a, it becomes a people's, a people issue, a people, a people weakness. When you have multiple, especially if like you have a multi-sig, you're trusting three, like three different individuals, let's say in three different geographic locations. So technically, yes, you are ultra secure, you know, your attack vectors, you know, one, one person gets compromised, no big deal. The problem becomes is what if you get into an argument with one of the parties involved? What if, you know, you can't reach one of the parties involved? What if somebody, one of these parties doesn't engage in proper security practices or is compromised? What if two of them are compromised and what do you do? You know, so it becomes like managing people is just as hard, if not harder than managing the tech itself. So this is, this is where I feel most people will run into issues when it comes to multi-sig. If they can handle it, like if a person comes from a tech background, I can do multi-sig. The people I engage with, I know can do multi-sig, will understand it. I'm not too concerned. So, but if you don't have um, that type of, that type of, person that you're entrusting, you know, to know what they're doing in case whatever happens, then you're taking a risk because, you know, anything can go wrong. You know, like you, you, somebody entrusts their husband or wife, they get into a fight, then what? You know, then you get into the whole complications of, okay, I don't want to give, I don't want to give you access anymore. I'm going to, you know, get in your way of doing this. And you, you sort of, you know, you, you get these complexities that you may not necessarily be thinking of today, but that can easily you know, uh, devolve into something really like cumbersome down the road. So that's, that's mostly why I'm against, you know, that type of complication for everyday people. I mean, we set up individuals with single SIG in ways that I am 99% sure absolutely nothing will happen to them. And especially when it comes to inheritance planning, I mean, we also have to strike a balance between practicality and security. Um, I'm a tech person, so I will handle everything, you know, on my own. If I pass away and my kids are not technical people, but I've, you know, I've, my setup is super complicated, then what happens? Then there's a big risk that they either screw up or forget to do something and potentially lose everything. So, you know, like we're taking all these added unnecessary risks for no reason. So we devise ways to work with people in order to balance you know, the, uh, the security and the practicality in a way that makes sense to them and whoever, uh, whoever else is involved um, in their ecosystem. So that's, that's really like the angle that I'm coming at for this. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And that's a different approach. I've never heard anyone really take that approach about multi-sig. Like that was very insightful. And it makes me think a lot too, because you know, I've always been a huge proponent of like Unchained Capital. There's all these different companies that um, when you read the fine print, they tell you like, OK, this happens if you pass away. We have an estate set up and then we have kind of a liaison to kind of tell the family member this is how you go about doing it. But now thinking about it, it makes sense when you say like, what if there's an argument? What if someone's being nefarious? What if the lawyer that you're using for the estate takes the keys and runs off with them, takes the instructions and runs off with them? There's so many different factors there that like, I think a lot of Bitcoiners probably don't think about. So thank you for giving that insight. I think that'd be really helpful for people inside of this ecosystem. Yeah, that's, that's precisely what I was referring to. And I mentioned these things because I've seen them happen. So the people problem is a big problem. Um, companies that offer like Unchained, I mean, I'm sure these guys do a terrific job, right? I mean, but Unchained is here today. Um, let's say I set up a system with them Let's say I live another 40, 50 years. Do you know with absolute certainty what's going to be around in 40, 50 years? You do not. You cannot. How do you know they're going to be around? How do you know that the people that they leave after them are going to be just as capable as they are? Do you have absolute trust in that roadmap? If the answer is no, then that's an unnecessary risk in my view. I like to maintain total control over my assets, especially when it comes to money. And if I'm going to be working with someone, I need them 
to be able to maintain total control over their money as well on their own without having to need the, the need to have anybody else's help. And if you're leaving it for kids, you know, like if you have kids or a wife that, you know, you want to make sure can access your assets, well, then I'm going to make sure that they sit down and I'm going to repeat the process, the educational process for as long as it takes until it becomes cemented in their DNA, how to use it, you know, and then they will pass on that knowledge in a similar, in a similar fashion, you know, to whoever they leave it behind. So there's many ways to approach this. Now, in certain, in certain situations, multi-sig is a must. You know, there's absolutely no trust amongst the entities, you know, whether it's a big business, whether it's a trust. I don't know. There's certain situations where you absolutely have to use it because there's no other way. In that case, okay, fine. You know, you can do it. But for the majority of people, I don't see it as an automatic instinctive. Yes, that's the way to go. Yeah, and I think I think now that the price is kind of lower, that incentive is not as big. But I mean, you know, I'm kind of a fan of like uh, something they call treasure hunting, where you have some Bitcoin here, you have some Bitcoin there, and of course, you know, there's people with out here with millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin, and I think that they don't trust themselves or they're not secure having a USB ledger or a cold card just sitting in their house in a safe. I think that they don't trust themselves enough to really be in control of that much money. So they kind of feel more comfortable dealing with the third party entity. You know, they're insured. If something happens, they can complain and possibly get their Bitcoin back, even though it's a little harder with Bitcoin versus FDIC fiat currency and stuff. But look at it makes a lot of sense to me now. Like, of course, I'm kind of technical as well. So I understand the approach. But, you know, that's a different take that I've never really thought about. And I definitely want to have more conversations with you about that because there's so many layers to this. The price goes up to a million dollars a coin, two million dollars a coin. I think you're going to have so many people um, invested in trying to hack, trying to break, trying to find ways to get into wallets. So I think we're still early and there's plenty of time for cybersecurity professionals such as yourself to really tinker and find more ways to be more robust and secure in the, in the technologies that we're kind of rolling out for customers. That, that's an excellent point that you bring up and you're absolutely spot on about this. I mean, right now the price of Bitcoin is around, as of this conversation, is around $26,000. So it's, it's not that big a deal. But when Bitcoin becomes worth hundreds of millions, possibly billions of dollars, there's going to be a lot of, you know, shark, shark eyes looking, hunting for it and potentially, you know, targeting certain people. So then you get into this whole um, uh, conversation around, you know, is your Bitcoin KYC or no KYC, right? Where did you buy it? Is the, is the, if you, did you buy it from somewhere that potentially got hacked? Is your, is your name on a database that got leaked? Are you now suddenly a target? If so, now you've got a problem on your hand. Like, how do you deal with it? You know, like you've got all these things that you need to think of, like that are likely to possibly happen down the line, not necessarily today. Like when I approach a situation, I'm not necessarily just looking at that right now. I'm looking at the now, but more importantly, down the line to see, am I prepared or am I as protected as possible in case X, Y, Z happens, you know, and, and those X, Y, Z scenarios, um, you develop them from experience, like you, you know, from, from situations that you've seen before, from news events that you read, from just common sense, you know, a lot of common sense comes into place and you try to like uh, forecast the scenario and you try to protect for it right now. So this is like, it's, 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 it's a big deal that we, like we look at, you know, with every individual that we sit down and talk and talk to, we try to learn more about them what their risk, you know, what their risk level is, what their lifestyle is, what they know, what they don't know. And we, you know, we have a conversation based on that conversation. We learn more about, about them. And then we, we come up with a solution, you know, like in my experience, the best security is the one that you don't know about. If I don't know what you're set up, that I don't know what to chase. I don't know what to attack. I'm chasing a ghost at that point. Right? So we don't have a copy paste um, solution that we just deploy for everybody that comes through the door. No, absolutely not. Every person that walks in may have, you know, similar things in common. Like for example, they're using the same uh, node or the same cold wallet, you know, like no big deal. But the, sec the security setup around these elements is very rarely the same. And that's done on purpose. And it's done, you know, with a lot of uh, insight into each person's, you know, lifestyle, 
circumstance and what have you. You know, not to go on a tangent about this because I want to ask you another question, but I think even on the basic level of just your internet connection, like so many people, they don't have secure internet. They don't have, you know, uh, WPA or WPA2. They just kind of just, they're using free Wi-Fi at Starbucks and they're transferring Bitcoin. You know, like there's just some crazy stuff going on around here. And it's just like um, people like you, Tony, I think are super helpful in that front. And, you know, the Bitcoin industry is full of these different innovations and opportunities. And the Bitcoin way is kind of this new thing coming out that people are going to be curious about. And it's just always good to see and to hear from someone on the cybersecurity side that's protecting their assets, like someone that's so experienced and well versed, such as yourself. I think that this this interview is really going to super help people that are interested in a Bitcoin way to trust to know that, hey, my Bitcoin is secure. This guy has skin in the game. He knows about cybersecurity and I can trust him that my Bitcoin is going to be safe. Absolutely, man. I mean, we, we make it a point to teach tips and tricks um, that people will can easily understand and remember. Like for, to, to, to go back to your point about using public Wi-Fi, that's an absolute no go. I mean, if you're going to use public Wi-Fi, you must have a VPN. You know, most people are like, what's a VPN? You know, like we're still at that stage. So retraining the mindset to understand, you know, why these things are important and to make people uh, want to use them and not feel that, oh, my gosh, this is so cumbersome. It's too much information. I don't want to handle it. I'd rather somebody else handle it. And then, you know, they go down that road and then something happens. They lose their money and then, you know, it's a big mess. So it takes a lot of patience to unlearn some of the bad habits if you want that we you know the convenience features that we were accustomed to doing and relearning new habits that yes okay they they require one or two or three extra steps but they're for a good cause and i absolutely want to learn them because if you don't self-custody your money you know if i mean it doesn't take a genius to see where the world is headed if you don't self-custody your money you're going to lose it or you're going to lose your freedoms by leaving your money where they are. So you pick, either you take five minutes to learn something new, which is not that hard. You know, when you have somebody explaining it to you properly, it's really not that hard. Or you do nothing and you pray that the world will somehow not affect you, which is a much bigger gamble in my opinion. And I would never, I would never take it personally. And speaking about the future, Tony, um, looking ahead, is there any upcoming projects developments that you're excited about that will kind of further enhance the security and understanding of Bitcoin related technologies? Yeah, absolutely, man. Everything that's happening on the Bitcoin ecosystem is, is, is fascinating. I mean, Bitcoin is a progressing technology. So that's also another thing to keep in mind is that whatever we do today in terms of setup, like, I mean, when I, like if I, when I set you up, you are like completely bulletproof and airtight, that's for sure. But in six months to one year, a lot of things would have changed. You know, you, there may be updates, upgrades, fine tuning, new, new hardware, new software that's come out. We need to stay on top of this. And this is especially important when you, when you uh, start putting together inheritance plan, inheritance planning, because that too needs to remain relevant. Because you know, we set it up today, you pass away in 40 years, a ton of things have changed between now and then. So every once in a while we revisit, we fine tune, we tweak, we re-educate. And uh, what's most exciting for me is the adoption. Uh, we, even I learn things every day simply by interacting with people because, you know, they, people come from all parts of life with all sorts of stories and situations that force me to expand my, you know, creative horizons security wise, you know, because, you know, somebody comes with a certain life situation and circumstance where traditional security measures don't apply to them. Like you actually really have to devise something custom made for them. So this is where, that's what gets me excited is because, you know, it keeps your brain working and pushing the boundaries of what you thought was perfect, you know, one level, two level, three levels, levels higher and helping people, you know, get to what they want to do, which is essentially protecting their money. So I'm excited about the global adoption. I mean, everything, the Lightning Network, you know, increased privacy, you know, on the Bitcoin ecosystem, which ultimately is going to is going to improve. It's going to increase all of these things that we cannot possibly foresee now because we've never had anything like Bitcoin um, is very exciting. But I'm not one to uh, to favor features over security. 
So the Bitcoin ecosystem, just to be completely transparent, like if it were not to change at all today, for myself, it would be, it would remain the number one most incredible innovation that ever happened in my lifetime. So I know there's people trying to push all sorts of side chains and all sorts of crazy ideas onto the Bitcoin blockchain. I'm not a fan of this, you know, like these things have to be approached with extreme paranoia and scrutiny before, you know, engaging in any feature that could potentially compromise the underlying security of the Bitcoin, the Bitcoin network. I mean, we've, we've come so far, um, 14, 15 years later, we've, uh, Bitcoin's resisted government attacks, Bitcoin's resisted all sorts of nonsense because it's built the way it's built. So we cannot start, you know, getting funky with this stuff just because we want an extra thing or ex an extra bell and whistle here and there. Absolutely no go. My nodes will, will throw you out instantly. And I'm sure most people invested in the ecosystem and understand Bitcoin properly will do the same. And it's important that that always remains um, at the forefront of everybody's priorities. Otherwise, you know, like you do not want to undermine perfect money by being careless. And I think that's the, the problem with some of the newer developers in the space where they're young, they're ambitious, they want to break things, they want things to kind of be more robust. And that's why you have BIPs, right? That's why you have this process of kind of consensus where you don't just get to approve something and it goes through. Like drivetrains right now are the big topic that people are talking about. A lot of people are against them. A lot of the younger crowd, they're kind of for it, but I don't think that they understand the grand scale of this is your retirement. This is your legacy. This is your generational wealth. I think because when you're in your 20s, you're not thinking about retirement. You're just trying to see how cool you can make things or how fast you can make things. And I completely agree with what you're saying, Tony. Absolutely, man. I mean, I'm very active on Twitter and so is the Bitcoin way. We're very active there. My handle is V4BTC as displayed here. Um, the Bitcoin ways handles the Bitcoin way underscore. Um, you're, everybody's welcome to call in. We offer free, uh, like an introductory free 30 minute call for anybody. Um, there are no stupid questions at the Bitcoin way. We, we handle all questions. We break down complex issues into bite sized pieces. There's no need to feel overwhelmed. Um, all the complicated work, if you don't want to do it, we will do it for you with you and uh, simplifying the entire end result so that every individual will end up using Bitcoin as easily as a credit card. I mean, that's the end game for most people because, I mean, I realize that not everyone necessarily wants to understand how the technology works in the back end, and that's fine, as long as they know that their assets are properly secured and that they can send and receive, you know, in a very simple way, that's all that matters. And we help every single individual and business get to that point seamlessly. Tony, this, this Bitcoin conversation has been awesome. I really appreciate it. Learning about cybersecurity, kind of getting into the technical intricacies of securing your, your, your databases, securing your protocol. And just for customers that are going to onboard onto the Bitcoin way, they can feel confident that their, their assets, their digital, you know, Bitcoin, you know, sovereign wealth is being protected by people that have their heads on straight. They're very experienced in the game, like I said earlier. So before we go, could you give people your social media handles? Please shout out the Bitcoin way. Give people their website before we go. Thank you for having me, man. And looking forward to, to doing this again sometime. Yes. Once again, thank you, Tony. This, this has been a great approach to cybersecurity. I feel a lot more confident just holding Bitcoin myself. And I think that a lot of people that onboard onto the Bitcoin way should feel the same way. So thank you for having this conversation, brother. Have a good one. Uh -huh.